we have been talking about adaptations and before we launch into new content and our new goal, which is largely about finding evidence around a main idea or that big claim, we want to remind ourselves all of those things that we've been learning over the last couple of weeks. And to help us do that, we're going to use a graphic organizer that draws from all of our, about our own background knowledge. So don't open it up yet, but you all have within your close read this. And you'll see this graphic organizer. And there's three columns here. One, it asks you, you're going to select an animal or type of animal. So think about all the animals that we have studied over the last couple of weeks, including those things that you've done in Clever online. So you're allowed to draw that as evidence as well. So you're going to select an animal. Then you're going to think about what challenges does it have in its environment. So the place it lives, what makes it difficult for that animal. And then finally, you're going to explain what adaptation or change has taken place so it can be more successful in that environment or place that it lives. So I want you to think about the video that we watched. And one of the animals that we learned about in that video was a polar bear. So I can write here a type of animal. I'm going to write polar bear. And as a quick reminder, are you guys allowed to copy what I put in here? Yes. Absolutely. So if you can't think of three, you're allowed to steal one from me. But I think about the polar bear, and then I think about what makes its environment challenging. And some of you may remember that, and I've got lots of hands already. So think for a second, what made that environment challenging? And just turn to the person seated next to you and remind them what makes that environment challenging. All right, we're back together in three, two, one. Uh, we'll cold call. Number five, uh, vivid orange. I don't have one of those, do I? So we'll go with number two. That's you. Go ahead. Um, the cold weather. All right, so we understand that where polar bears live, it's Arctic, it's really cold. And I see lots of hands. But I'm just going to add right here, because I want you to be able to do this on your own. We know that it has fur. And there was something special about that fur, so I want to be precise. And again, it's great that there's all these hands. And we knew that that fur was actually translucent. The other thing that we understand about the fur and that the bear itself is it has black skin. And having fur that's translucent and black skin then allows it to adapt to this cold environment. So what you're going to do right now, you can do this individually, you can do this with pairs, you can do this as a whole group, but I want you to identify. It would be best if you could think of your own three animals, but if you can only think of two, you can use mine. Identify three animals explain their environmental challenge, what makes it difficult for them to survive, and then finally, what adaptations have they made to be successful? Can't, can't hang on cheese. 
without the adaptation. That's brilliant. Uh, and we'll come back together in three, two, one. Utensils down. And hands up, fine. Uh, we're going to do a silent gallery walk. So what you're going to do is you're going to move around the classroom and you're going to look at the written responses of your classmates. Don't move quite yet. The key here is we've got to be at level zero so that all of our attention, one second, I just lost two of you. So we're at level zero because what you're doing is you're reading the written responses of your classmates. Because some of you wrote about gray owls, some of you chose my idea of polar bears, other people added things about camels, uh, another one was flying frogs, so it's really clever the number of different ideas that we're seeing from your classmates and I want you to see all of those right now. So you're going to stand up and at level zero you're going to move around the room and you're going to see what other people have written. All right, and then go ahead and find your seat. All right, that was really impressive. And how about we have a couple of volunteers who then can share what they have come up with in terms of an animal, its environmental challenge, and then the adaptation that it made in order to be success successful in that environment. And I think, well, I don't even know who my last speaker was. We'll do it this way. You have the right to pass. Number four, Daffodil Yellow. I chose iguana, and that there are many predators, and that adaptations to help the animal meet this challenge is it can camouflage and it has a dwell to look bigger. All right, perfect. I chose cheetah and it's very plain and it can move fast and can camouflage. All right, and what do you mean by very plain? Yeah, and same remember what that's described. So the environment it lives in has a specific type of name because there's not very many trees there. Allison? Yeah, so we're in the savanna, so it's adapted to live in the savanna. We'll do one more and then we'll transition. Caitlin? All right, so they're able to take advantage of all those trees and so they've adapted with its tail. Really strong work. You're going to bring a pencil and your close read and take a seat in front of the active board. So if I look at this section, we're on to our very last extended read where we're learning about adaptations. And again, we're looking for main ideas or the big claim of our author and then those details that help us understand how we can support that main idea or how the author is correct in making that claim. So what is the title of this selection, Jordan? The title of the selection is called One Body, Many Adaptations. All right, so this idea, we have One Body, but Many Adaptations by Judy Black. And do I have a volunteer who's going to go ahead and read the first paragraph for us? Animals live in many different places. Some animals live in hot deserts. Others live in frigid oceans. However, all have become adapted to their, where they live. They, where an animal lives de determines its adaptation. Animals rely on this special feature to survive. All right. Now we're going to go ahead and we're going to read both paragraphs because both of these paragraphs serve as our introduction. All right. 
Structural. Structural adaptation. An animal might use body covering, camouflage, and special body parts to survive. The octopus, the penguin, the camel are animals with many structural adaptations. All right. So there are some details here, but there's one big idea, that main idea. In other words, there's something that the author is trying to understand or have us understand, and then he's going to support what he's trying to have us understand. And before we try to figure out exactly what that adaptation is, what I want you to do is I want you to go ahead and I want you to look at the pictures and the subheadings to help us understand what this main idea is, and then we'll go back to the first two paragraphs. What is the main idea here? You're going to hand up, pair up. Do you have a partner? Two, two, two. Oh, Kyler, you're with Indies. What do we think the main idea might be? Structural adaptations. And what are structural adaptations? kind of brilliant, isn't she? <laughs> Perfect. All right. Uh, we're going to have Gray. He's going to go ahead and call on a girl because uh, we've heard from more boys this morning than girls. All right. So she had this idea, this main idea is we have body parts to survive. Yeah, so, and we had Allison, so you're building on the idea because she was a little bit more precise. So who can continue with this idea of what Witt said? We have adaptations. Allison said body parts. Structural adaptations. All right. And structural adaptations, we learn over here, adapted body parts are called structural adaptations. So we just co-constructed between Caitlin, Allison, and Witt. We have this idea. There's my main idea. Adapted body parts are called structural adaptations. And what do those structural adaptations allow animals to do? All right, so in some instances, it might be able to make them camouflage, but we haven't learned that quite yet. What do we learn in the first two paragraphs that these structural adaptations allow us to do what? And camouflage is not wrong, it's just not included in these first two paragraphs, the author's main idea. Um, uh, body parts? So again, that's one of our structural adaptations, and when we have these structural adaptations, what do they allow us to do? helps them survive. So in this particular case, our author has kind of taken the main idea and moved it into a couple of different spots. Animals rely on these special features to survive. Adapted body parts are called, called structural adaptations. So these structural adaptations, I'm going to star it, because that's where our main idea has been hidden, these structural adaptations. And so when we read in just a moment, we're going to be looking for these. And I'm going to put in the note over here, Structural adaptations help animals survive. So when we read in just a moment, we're going to be looking for evidence of this claim or this main idea. Did you remember a pencil? Nice job, Devin. Perfect, Jordan. We'll give you a couple more seconds if you want to write down this, because we want to take, we want to annotate for evidence, which includes that underlying idea, but then we also want to make notes where we're paraphrasing some of these big ideas so we can use them later when we get to our writing.
So we got you started. We've got this main idea. So what you're going to do now, and this is going to be fairly familiar, you're responsible for the following. You're going to silently read paragraphs 3 through 12. When you're done with that, you're going to partner read that same section. And then you're going to annotate for the main idea and claim, right, this idea that structural adaptations help animals survive. Um, and yeah, we're independent, so you're allowed to move around. the colors, colors on the ocean floor to blend into its surroundings. The octopus has projections uh, sticking out of its skin and special color changing skin cells. Within one second, its body, body parts to survive. An octopus body has several parts that help help it survive too. Its best known body parts are the its eight arms with suction cups. An octopus uses its arms for moving, turning, eating, tasting, and even matching. It, if it loses an arm, no problem. Another arm will grow on its face. All right. Do you know what this word is, right? There. Matting? Mating. Penguins oh, mostly live in very cold places, such as Antarctica. These flightless birds swim a lot. They spend more time than half their time swimming. They spend the more than half their time swimming in, in, in icy ocean water. Predators fly above them and swim below them. So, so how does the penguin survive these challenges? At do you remember what this is called? Yeah, it's a rhetorical question. Adaptations, you want to read that or do you want me to read it? Perfect. The penguin. Remember, you're looking for structural adaptations that help the animal survive. All right, so you're underlining a lot, which is great. So its best body parts are its eight arms with suction cups. The octopus uses its arms for moving, hunting, eating, tasting, and even mating. So how can we paraphrase that? Because it, because it, it's part of the structural adaptations help, to help animals survive. So what do its body parts do? Its body parts are its eight arms with suction cups. Yeah, so probably we don't need to underline everything here. We're probably just good with eight arms and suction cups. And what do the eight arms with suction cups do? Help it move, hunt, eat, and taste. So that way we can paraphrase it and make it super short for you. All right, so how can you go ahead and paraphrase? So what do its body parts do? So, the bill, so it can, its body parts help it catch prey, and what else? Um, it, um, it, it's, it, um, camouflage, camouflage. All right, so that's the idea, which is we've got all of this underlined, now can we can paraphrase it to make it really succinct when we have to use it in our own writing. All right, camouflage. Yeah, you can say camouflage, and what's the camouflage? Um, black, a black Perfect. So you got that whole idea, and now you paraphrase for me. All right. 
That's perfect. So you know it's just it's eight arms and suction cups. And what do those arms and suction cups do? They help the octopus with moving, hunting, eating, tasting, and even So let's try to paraphrase that in our notes. That's really good. All right, this is perfect that you understood. Right, we have eight arms with suction cups. And what do those eight arms with suction cups do? They help it eat, taste, um, mate, and hunt. Mm -hmm. So let's put that in our notes. The arms help it eat, move, hunt, and even mate. Um, so that way we're paraphrasing all of that information for us. Yes, brilliant annotator. Octopus is much like the chameleon, and this way would be one. I don't know, what did Wit say? I'm not going to answer that one. All right, so we got to paraphrase this stuff, right? So if we're going to underline all this, this one, the first penguins bothering help it survive in cold places. So this doesn't really tell me what the body part is, right? Mm -hmm. So we got to be really specific. So what body parts help it survive and how? The, the layer of blubber. All right, so awesome that you understood. Well, this is part of it, right? It has eight arms with suction cups. So what do the eight arms and suction cups do? Um, it uses it to... An octopus uses it to for moving, hunting, eating, tasting, and even moving. So go ahead and why don't you put that in the margin, so those little notes right there. All right, so for this one, first the penguin's body recovering helps it survive in cold places. That's kind of the main idea of this paragraph. So we know that something in this paragraph is going to tell us about which body part. Which body parts help it survive in cold weather? Blubber. Yeah, what else? Feathers. Okay, so that's what we want to put in our notes so that we can quickly go back later and we can identify this idea of blubber, this idea of feathers. How about 15 more seconds? Look at these nice notes. Brilliant. And we'll do a utensils down, hands up. All right. So if you are interested, you're welcome to volunteer. We're going to share several examples of the annotations that we found about these structural adaptations, these body parts that help these animals survive. And it goes back to what we focused on at the very beginning. These body parts are helping it survive in its unique environment. So if your hand is up in the air, you're ready to come up here. You're going to share with your annotation, and then you're going to explain why, so that we get the reasoning. You have the right to pass. Daffodil yellow again. Number four. It's perfect. Make sure you use the microphone for us. Penguins barry. Will you go ahead and point where you are right now so we can see what annotations you have? Okay. The penguin's body covering helps it survive in cold places. So I'm going to, wait a minute, keep that up there. We got to be precise. So which body parts help them survive in cold places? Because we want to know very specifically about those structural adaptations. The OK, and what else? And feathers. And feathers. And so one of the values of writing our notes in the margin, I'm going to pick on Ethan right here. He had the same annotations as Gray. The only difference is he added this part, blubber and feather so he can quickly retrieve this information. Thank you, Gray. Go ahead and call on somebody for me. Hi there. Um, an octopus also has a, 
It uses its powerful mouth to hold down prey to it, it its powerful beak-like jaws break open the shells. Its mouth is strong. All right, and so if we were just to paraphrase, what's the structural adaptation it has? Um, the strong mouth, a jaw-like mouth. Okay. Well, you got like one person who agrees with you. I happen to agree with you. Thank you, sir. All right. Will you make sure you call on a girl for me? Yeah. Um, Indies. Their wings look like ripples to, to help them swim. Will you point to where you found that piece of evidence? Nice. Their wings look like ripples to help them swim, but feet will for better swimming. Okay. And why is that important? All right, so we need to be able to swim quickly if we're going to be able to get away from predators. Nicely done. We'll do one more. Um, its body is soft. Its body is very soft and slimy. The slimy skin helps keep it hidden. All right, nicely done. Not only did you pull out the annotation, but then you paraphrase an entire paragraph for us. So that's a nice note to end on. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to close your close read for me. We're not done with this yet, so don't put it away. What you're going to do right now is you're going to find your confidence buddy. We have lost and found. We're missing two people. They're going to come to the active board. I just lost two of you. We'll wait. You're going to find your confidence buddy. You're going to remind them what is a closed syllable and what is an open syllable. When you have your answer, take a seat in front of the active board. If you're lost and found, you're already going to go to the active board. All right. My instructional goal right now is to remind ourselves and review what we know about open syllables and closed syllables and to start thinking about words where there are syllable junctures. So before we can do that, we need to remind ourselves what's a closed syllable and an open syllable. So think to yourself. You had that conversation with your classmates. Uh, Thomas, do you remember what a closed syllable and an open syllable is? A closed syllable is a vowel that, that doesn't say its name, and an open syllable is a vowel that does say its name. All right, so, and we want to be, we can build on that language, so it says its name or it doesn't say its name. What do we call those things? So we get a long vowel, and then what would be the opposite of our long vowel, Allison? Short vowel. So if I look at this word right here, Taryn, go ahead and read that first word for us. Frigid. Frigid. Now what closes the syllable for us is a consonant. So when I look at frigid, I see that I have two short vowels, and I get fridge. And there must be a break there, because that consonant is making a short vowel sound. So fridge, id, and I use a long slash in order to indicate that I've divided. How many closed syllables do I have there? How many syllables do I have? Raina, how many syllables do I have in the word frigid? Two. Two. So I have two closed syllables. Jordan, will you go ahead and read the next word for us? Limited. We have limited. So I want you to think for a second. If a consonant helps us make that closed syllable sound, or a closed vowel sound, or a short vowel sound, how many syllables do you hear in the word limited? Hi there. I hear three. All right, so we know that there's three. And then we got to figure out where those junctures are. So if I look at limited and we understand that the consonant is going to create that short vowel sound for us, think about the very first syllable. Call on somebody for me. Um, uh, the first one is limb. Yeah, we get limb. It. It. Ed. Ed. 
All right. Hand up, pair up, and then I want you to figure out this word right here. Devin, you're with Jordan. All right, Grayson, you're with Ethan. So what's the very first syllable? All right, we're back together in three, two, one. All right, Ethan, go ahead and cold call somebody for us. How many syllables did you hear? Three. So we got three syllables. And do you want to do the junctures for us or do you want to call somebody? Thomas. You want to do it? Yeah. Okay. Stroke. Struck. Mm-hmm. All right, and look at all those people who agree with you. So we broke down structural into its three patterns. Um, we're going to stop right there, but it, when we get to uh, some of our independent practice, this will be the sheet that you're working on which works on this idea of a closed syllable and recognizing the pattern within closed syllables. Um, go ahead, we're gonna make it all the way over to the easel, bring your snack. All right, so we're continuing with this idea of understanding adaptations. And one of the things that we understand is animals that have grown up on islands have ended up with different adaptations than animals that end up on what are called the mainland, parts of continents. So I want you to think about why would the adaptations on an island be a little bit different than what you would find on the mainland? So this is called only on an island. Strange things can happen to animals on an island. Isolated and cut off from many, par many of the plants and animals they were used to, Island animals often change their habits to suit their new surroundings. And over thousands of years, the animals change too. So the author used this great word, isolated. I want to read that again. I want you to think about what isolated might mean based on what we know about islands and then some of the context the author gives us. Isolated and cut off from many of the plants and animals they were used to, island animals often change their habits to suit their new surroundings. So what do we think this word isolated might mean? And I'll read it again while other people are thinking. Isolated and cut off from many of the plants and animals they were used to, island animals often change their habits to suit their new surroundings. What do we think isolated might mean? Johnny, yes, will you call on somebody for me? All right, and so Ryan used that text and several people agree. This idea of isolated must mean cut off, so they're by themselves instead of being with the other animals on the mainland. Some large animals find less food to eat on small islands, so over time they grow smaller. Key deer, and that's that image right there, found on the island of the Florida Keys are half the size of white-tailed deer living on the mainland. Animals that use their small size to hide from enemies often have fewer big predators on an island. Instead of helping them, their small size makes it harder for them to compete for food. So the little animals grow bigger. The Galapagos Islands are famous for their giant tortoises, which are big enough to carry a person. Heavier and longer than a grown man, the Komodo dragon, found on the islands of Indonesia is the largest lizard in the world. So there's our Komodo dragon, and there's our giant tortoise of the Galapagos. Some animals change so much they no longer act like their mainland relatives at all. The marine iguanas on the Galapagos Islands are the only lizard in the world that swim and dive for food. 
Long ago, when the Kakapos first flew to the islands of New Zealand, they were like other parrots, daytime birds with big, strong wings. But other daytime birds hunted them. So over time, Kakapos became nighttime birds. With plenty of food to eat and no enemies on the ground, they grew fatter and their wings grew smaller and weaker until they could no longer fly. So we learned something special about this one. We learned that so over time, Kapakos became nighttime birds. What's another word to describe animals? In this case, that would be awake at night, hunting at night. Aaron, were you my last speaker? Ryan, go ahead and call somebody. Um, nocturnal. Yeah, so we have these evolved from carrots or adapted, and now they are nighttime birds or nocturnal. And some animals that were once widespread gradually died out on the mainland, where they, were, where they had to compete with stronger, smarter animals. But they continue to thrive on the remote island homes. Today, tarsiers are found only on the islands of Southeast Asia. The big island of Madagascar has lakes, dry deserts, rainy forests, steep hills, and flat plains. Millions of years ago, lemurs from nearby Africa spread across the island and over time adapted to the different types of areas. Now no, lem no lemurs live in Africa, but nearly 100 different kinds can be found in Madagascar. So I want you to think it's said right off the coast of Africa. And so before we conclude our read aloud, uh, we understand that animals have adapted differently on islands just because there's different predators there, there's different uh, opportunities for them to eat. And we learned about the lemurs adapted on the island of Madagascar. So to give you a sense of where that is, let's start with where we are, Reno. And on what continent am I going to find Reno Gray? Uh, North America. Yeah, so we're in North America. So when I type in Madagascar, let's see what happens. So we're moving away from the continent of North America, crossing the Atlantic, and there's Madagascar, and we learned in our reading that's off the coast of Africa. Yeah. All right, nice job, you guys. All right, so you have five tasks we have to do to be before we're done with literacy this morning. First thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to clean pleat this, your closed syllable. And nobody's going to move until our clerks have handed them their worksheet. When you are done with this, you're going to log into Clever. You're going to learn more about polar bears and several other animals. And your comprehension questions, which is the third task, is up on the whiteboard. So you peel the sticker off, and I want you to complete that in your response journal. Uh, if you haven't finished yesterday's writing graphic organizer, that's the fourth task. And then finally, that will give you some of you time for Reader's Workshop. The three most important things to me are, one, we finish this. Two, you're in Clever, and you're reading your leveled reader. And then three, you're answering the comprehension question and the stickers are up on the whiteboard. Again, nobody moves until they have this. Oh, there she is. Thank you. So it's separate. So what is it? When sharp and dull, are those synonyms or antonyms? No, because it's opposite. Uphill is to downhill. Green is to. So I think you're right. I think sticky must go here, which means this can't be sticky.
Nice job. Uh, yeah, go ahead and turn them in. If you're missing your QR code, we'll put them up on the uh, bean table. Look how good you are. That's awesome.